Our blue planet. What a wonderful world. Whether you're sailing over its surface, dipping beneath its skin on a scuba dive or a snorkel, playing in its waves, standing on the shoreline, gazing at it, or plunging into its very heart, the deep ocean. What a wonderful world. I am beyond lucky. I've spent 20 years exploring our blue planet in multiple ways, any which way I can be in it, on it, under it. And from all of that time, all of those years living at sea, thousands of hours scuba diving, 500 hours in submersibles, I've just chosen three moments. I could tell you many, many, many stories. But today I'm just going to tell you three. And the first, it's like a scene from an action movie. It's that moment of grave danger where everything is about to go hideously wrong. And in that moment, it's only when we turn out the lights that we can actually see what's truly going on. And the second moment, it's like a scene from a sci-fi movie. In this moment of exquisite exploration, we find ourselves in a world, an entire world, no humans have ever seen before. But what makes this moment so much more precious is we revisit it the very next day. It's disappeared. The third moment I'm going to tell you about is from The Greatest Love Story. I'm going to share with you the day I lost my heart to a magnificent ocean creature. I am not a natural born oceanaut. I was born and raised here, just on the fringes of London. My parents are Irish. So I spent my entire childhood ping-ponging from here to Ireland, and that meant crossing the Irish Sea. It's a really little sea, but my God, can it feel like a really big sea. And there was one year, it was summer, it wasn't a Christmas crossing, it was a summer crossing, so, you know, gentle ocean, no. Mum got experimental with our picnic. This is back in the 70s, and these newfangled things called prawn cocktail snacks have just appeared on the supermarket shelves. So mum bought them for our picnic as a special treat. The sea picked up, and we picked ourselves up, and we all ran to the ship's railings. And it was like a scene from Goldilocks. There's Papa Bear, there's Mama Bear, and there are three baby bears. I'm one of those. And we are just clinging on for dear life. The ferry is rolling. So are the contents of our stomachs. I have not eaten prawn cocktail snacks ever since. <laughs> so I spent the next 20 years happy and comfortable and content on the solid ground of the shoreline and just looking out at that great big thing called the ocean. And I would just look at it and think, you're beautiful. I like it here, but you're beautiful, but I like it here. And that all changed in one moment when I took myself underwater for the very first time. And I had this cylinder on my back, this heavy thing, and I was in this constricting neoprene wetsuit and I was all kind of squished into it and I had this leaking mask on my face and there was water coming in and I had this giant black thing in my mouth and this was the thing that was going to keep me alive and this was going to let me breathe underwater. Before I could get to grips with any of this kit, any of this technology that was going to hold me together, I put my head under that surface 
and I saw for the very first time a coral reef. And my heart pretty much stopped because I was coming from London, this beautiful city of skyscrapers and millions of people, millions of busy inhabitants all on a mission to do something now, 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 now. And here I was suddenly on this underwater metropolis, again, full of busy inhabitants needing to do things now, 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 now. But these were kooky fish and crazy starfish and sea cucumbers. A cucumber that lives in the sea. A unicorn fish. There are unicorns on this planet. They're in the ocean. And parrotfish with bug eyes and buck teeth. I just looked at all these animals in the eye and I thought, my God, you're extraordinary. I'd like to live with you. So the next 20 years have been an epic voyage. So the first moment to tell you about, come with me, get in my submarine with me. We're going diving. We're in Antarctica. We're going to really where no humans have ever been before. We're going to put ourselves on the deep seabed a thousand meters from the surface in this amazing ocean at the bottom of our world. No one's ever done that. So we're on our very first dive. We're going down, and as you go down in a submarine, you leave the surface, and that means you leave the sun behind you and all its glorious light that helps you see where you're going and what's happening. So as you go deeper and deeper and deeper, you put your lights on. In Antarctica, when you put your lights on, you draw in these little animals called krill. Krill are tiny, and they are fundamental. Life in Antarctica lives and dies by krill. So we're going down, and the krill are coming because they're like moths to a flame, and they're coming to our lights. We start with a couple of krill, and then we have its friends come in, and then more friends come in, until actually it gets to a point where we can no longer see where we are going. We're now 450 meters from the surface, and we know on our sonar that we're about to touch down. So there is, we're no longer in the free fall of water. We are about to make contact with effectively underwater land but we can't see it because we have so many krill in the way. This isn't good. <laughs> this is not good. Genius idea. Let's put out the lights. Let's shake off those krill. The lights brought them in. You put the lights out. They will go. When you put yourself in an extraordinary situation, sometimes extraordinary things will happen. We know that krill bioluminesce. That's what they're doing. But no humans have ever seen that before in the deep water of Antarctica. So my second extraordinary situation. We were filming in the Gulf of Mexico, again in the deep ocean, again gathering extraordinary footage to share with you all in Blue Planet 2. We were filming at the Brian Pool, crazy lake at the bottom of the sea, <laughs> head spinning enough in and of itself. We'd been filming there for days. It was all going really well. I was working with an incredible woman, a scientist called Mandy. And Mandy whispered to me one night, she said, Orla, this brine pool is all going brilliantly. Do you know what? I think there's another thing that you should see. I know about some little bubbles coming out of the seafloor. I said, well, Mandy, that all sounds fantastic. Sounds amazing. Can you show me a photo? No, I don't have any. Okay, um, so can you tell me about the bubbles? Well, I, I don't know much about them, but I think it could be really, really interesting. So I've got nothing to look at. I've got no real description to go on. But she's telling me about little bubbles. I've been working with Mandy for two years by this point. Mandy says, Orla, I think you'd like it. And so I say, let's go. 
So I tell the ship, I tell the film crew, I say, we're going. And they say, we're going where? We're go why are we going? Why are we? We're filming at the Bible. It's going brilliantly. Why would we leave? And I say, we're going because Mandy says there's something over there. It's 100 miles over there. This is no small feat. And they're like, big mistake, Orla. Big mistake. And I said, no, we're, we're going to do this. We're just going to trust. The next day, we moved the ship that night. The next day, we take the submarines down. It's an hour to get to the seafloor. We're now at 750 meters. <laughs> and we land on a desert. And there's nothing there. And I am slightly freaking out. Big mistake, all are ringing in my ears. This is a big mistake. And then suddenly, Those little bubbles Mandy talked about, the giant bubbles this size rocketing out of that sea floor. When we got to the surface that evening and I said, <laughs> Mandy, wow, I was not expecting that. And I showed her what we'd filmed and she said, nor was I. That day, the deep ocean let us in on a little secret and we got to film something extraordinary, something phenomenal. And when we went back down to that very same site, the very next day, we were back on the desert. And we spent six hours on that desert, and not one bubble emerged. My third moment comes from the more familiar ocean, the coral reef. We spent three months, this is in my life as a coral reef, explorer, researcher. We spent three lives on the Great Barrier Reef, a really well-known reef, and there's a really well-known creature that comes to it every year, and that is the minke whales. They come up from Antarctica to the warmth and the safety of the Barrier Reef. And this is a, a place where there's a really, really solid protocol about how to interact with these extraordinary animals, because your temptation is to just hurl yourself in the water and go charging at them, because they are so hypnotically beautiful and attractive, but there are really strict ways that you do this. And so what you do is you put out a long rope from your ship, and then everyone hangs onto this rope, and you stay still. And if the whales choose to come to you, that's their choice. You don't make the move to them. So these whales would come day after day after day, and we were moving up and down the reef and really exploring it and, and taking data from it. One day, this one whale came, and I just lost it for him. He was so beautiful. He was so playful. He was so <laughs> drawn to me, and I was so drawn to him. He was my whale. And by this point, I'd probably met 50 of his family and friends, but this was my guy. And we stayed with each other for as long as I humanly could, but I was getting cold. I was running out of air, and I had to get up. So I left him, almost tearfully, and I left him. And I got back on the ship. And the next day, we had to move our ship 20 miles to the south, because we had another reef that we needed to go and explore and take data from. So we moved. The next day, someone up on deck yells, the whales are here, the whales are here. Out goes the line. We get in the water. We line up. Out of nowhere, there is this thing, this giant thing, and it is coming at me at the speed of light. And I'm kind of in the middle, and there's five people that way, and there's five people that way. And there is this thing, and it's coming at me so fast, I am actually starting to get scared. And as it approaches, it turns. There's this kind of handbrake turn in front of me. It's my guy. And the reason I know it's my guy, there's a nick in his pectoral fin, the most distinctive scar. He's, been, he's had a collision with something, or he's been attacked by something at some point, and there is a nick. And when he was turning, my belief is he was turning mm. to show me, hey, look, it's me. So I said, hi, good to see you. <laughs> 
why am I telling you these three stories? They're my stories from my small life on this big ocean. I'm telling you them because they're just a microcosm of a much bigger story, and that is the story of our beautiful blue planet. But the greater story we don't yet know. We truly have better maps of Mars than we do of our deep sea. And yet, more than 90% of the living space on this Earth is ocean. This thing we call land, <laughs> these things we call humans, we are so insignificant. Unfortunately, we're not. But by ratio, we should be. There's so much more to explore and discover. I'm going to do it till I can't <laughs> have to stop. And I think you can explore in your own imagination. I think you can dream up your craziest creatures, your most extraordinary encounters, entire undiscovered worlds. Because you just might find that one day we find them. Thank you.